Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of Cinemental. Now this I can do. I can't compete with you physically, and you're no match for my brain. I don't give a crap if you covered yourself in peanut butter and had a 15-hooker gangbang. Okay, welcome. As always, I'm joined by Hassan Godwin and Lathan Conger III. This week, a little bit different, however, as we are joined today for the first time with a guest, and we'll be discussing one of their favorite films. Our guest is an Emmy Award-winning cartoonist best known for creating Billy Dogma and The Red Hook, collaborating with Harvey Picar and Jonathan Ames, and illustrating for HBO's Bored to Death. His published work includes writing and drawing for Marvel, DC, Archie, Image, and Webtoon. In addition, He's also an accomplished playwright, which I can attest to personally, as I was attended to one of his plays. Coming all the way today from Brooklyn, New York, Mr. Dean Hatsfield. What's up, Dean? Hello, guys. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. I, I couldn't be, I could not be happier to have you on. Um, I'm the first guest. You're the very first guest on our <laughs> on our show. So that is, uh, that, is, that is a position you will hold forever. Um, when we hit episode 587, it'll be really important that you were the first. Yeah. That's right. That's right. When uh, when you make your seventh or eighth appearance on the show, yeah. Right. When we're when we're at uh, COVID 37. At that oh point. God. <laughs> oh. What were That's they saying funny. about the? There was like the COVID 19, but people were talking about the COVID 15. Did you hear about that? No. Uh, no. 15, there were ones the 15 before pounds this. That, that they gained uh, ah. during COVID 19. Ah. That's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to be worse than that for a lot of people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I, I I did a lot of home cooking and I, I got really yeah. good. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Me it's too? been a, it's, it's been an, uh, uh, it's been interesting. It's the only <laughs> thing I can give it. It's been now without going into <laughs> any elaboration. It's been oh, very okay. interesting. Okay. Right. So, Dean, what we normally do is we start off with a little segment called News That Gives Us Fits, which is basically entertainment news from the week that uh, drives us a little crazy. Mm. So, some news that gives us fits. No! 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 I just saw today, actually, and I, I had to bring this up. Um, George R. R. Martin <laughs> came out today and said he's pretty sure that he's going to be able to finish that last uh, Game of Thrones book by next year. Nice. Does anybody care? <laughs> Not anymore. I do. Um, I think, but, look, okay. but, I think right. absolutely it will blow up. because li Listen, I didn't read it. Oh, they'll sell 10 million yeah, copies. Yeah, I, I didn't read the books at all. But I have a, I mean, did you, Hassan? Were you, yeah, I read the book. So I read the first three. I, have a, I mean, it's going to be different from the ending of the show, right? Thankfully. I would assume. So that's why. That's why oh, it's going to blow up. Don't. You know? So listen, uh, I agree. I I agree with everything that happened at the end of the show. I don't agree with the way it happened, the with the pacing of it. So hopefully, I'm. Okay. Hopefully, the books are going to flesh things out to an extent that sure. actually give you a better perspective on the show. You know, in and of itself, right. it's his story. Right. He should finish it. Yeah, um, I agree. His entity. I wouldn't. Me personally, as a writer, I would, and I, look, I'm speaking out of my ass. I do not know what it's like to have written something like what he wrote. I would not have let anybody beat me to the end of my own story, though. Yeah, you know? great point. I would have made it a point <laughs> to get there first, regardless of what it, you yeah. know. What now, it it's really, it's, he's in a unique position to see what works and what didn't work. So he can, you know, but I don't, I don't believe he'll do that. I don't believe he'll tweak it. Yeah. yeah. No, I think he had his plan and he's going to go with Steve, it. Steve, you got to think about it though. I, I remember. Keep in mind, I haven't watched the last season. No, I'm not, I'm not going to say a word about it. Um, oh, you are lucky. I liked oh, it. I liked oh, it. I enjoyed uh, it. I liked it. I just think it could have been different. But the I, pacing, I didn't. The pacing <laughs> yeah. is that. Uh, I I read A Dance with Dragons. I want to say 2012. Wow. It's is that the fifth yes, book? It's 2020 okay. now. Nuts. Yeah. yeah. It's almost yeah. 10 years. It's taken yeah, him on, to write dude, another book. Going. So I don't really 
give a horse's ass about like you know that's it's ridiculous it's ridiculous now he doesn't have to do what i want him to do by any stretch of the imagination he's an artist he could take his time there's a there's a there's a there's a latin saying uh sat si sat benny which means it's it is done quickly enough if it's done well right so if he feels he's done it right he's taken as much time as he thinks he needs to to have taken it right that's how long it took right. to do however <laughs> however harper <laughs> lee take, yes, harper lee. take <laughs> taking all the rationality out of it. yeah harper lee yeah exactly taking all the rationality out of it come on man you had an entire television show start and finish in the time it took us waiting for one book from you meanwhile brandon sanderson's pooping out books you know like, <laughs> like, like out. all i can hear is jeremy piven going 10 that's years, it's man. crazy <laughs> it is it is absolutely crazy and it's not it won't even be the last book if he takes another 10 years to write that last book oh i thought this was the no last. this is winds of winter the, the dream of book. spring is the seventh book this he's supposedly going seven books you're never going to see that. I mean, it's not happening. Older fans are going to die. They're he's not going to get gonna to see the end of the story. You're letting he's your gonna, older fans he's die. He's 71 years old. He might he'll, die. That's he'll a, die. He's got to ghostwrite it. Brian Herbert. Oh. <laughs> oh you man, did dude. not just do that. Did you have worms are for you dinner, buddy? kidding me? Uh, he did. Uh, Hassan, he did that. He did it. <laughs> Game, of, Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's on All record. Right. So just just real quick, I wanted to touch on a couple of new recent movie trailers that come out as well. Uh, and I don't know, Dean, I don't know if you had a chance, if you, how, how you keep up with movie trailers at all as they come out. A little bit, a little bit. I had texted these guys earlier to see if they had seen uh, the movie Train to Busan. I did. Korean zombie movie. Oh, excellent. Uh, have you seen the trailer for the sequel? It's awesome. I guys, think it looks yeah, great. Thoughts? It's awesome. It looks bananas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> It looks bananas. I yes. can't wait. As 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 bananas as the uh, as the first film was. Yeah. Uh, this just looks to uh, expand upon that. Absolutely. That sort of go that, for it. That, yeah. The, yeah. I, I'm I'm definitely on board. Yeah. Like, well, I was just gonna say, I the thing that got me uh, pumped today. You know, I can't wait to go back to the movie theater and see a movie in the theater. Obviously, the one I can't wait to see it first is Tenet. But mm -hmm. Robert Pattinson today said. Tenet is the greatest plate spinning trick ever. <laughs> I just thought that was an, the perfect way to describe a, a, a Christopher Nolan movie. Wow. And now, now I can't wait to see how he's going to pull this off. I believe so, it. Yep. I is that a compliment it. or an insult, though? I mean, oh, like, that's a compliment. I guarantee you he means it as a compliment. I mean, Inception is a spinning plate movie for sure. So. And then the other trailer was uh, The King's Man. The third Kingsman movie. I have not. Oh yeah, uh, I haven't. Seen I'm a huge fan of the first two films. Uh, I think, yeah, I think again, this is you know, it, it's like I think that if you're you know, much in the same way that the Mummy trilogy is, it's it's three films that if you enjoy them, you just enjoy them, and I think that Kingsman, and don't get me wrong, far better films than the Mummy films. Oh, thank uh, you for that uh, cor correction there. Yeah, I appreciate uh -huh. it. Oh, but certainly uh, on an entertainment level, the Mummy films do their job. So, <laughs> come on, see the trailer? Did you guys see the trailer? Tove, T-O-V-E? Oh, I no. heard about it. I heard about it. So I it's the, it's, it's uh, Tove, I just learned about it today, and I shared it on my Facebook. It's uh, the first trailer for the biopic of the Moomins creator, Tove Jansen. You know Moomins? Uh, no. European famous comic uh it's basically a car uh, a movie about a cartoonist or an artist oh, okay. that became a cartoonist that uh moomins is like a a childhood favorite for a lot of people it's a european uh comic uh like asterix? It looks like a really good like asterix but they look like like hippopotamus kind of characters um fanic okay. graphics i believe is published or republished and reprinted a lot of their uh of these comics so anyway just to add some throw some comics into this to the mix so oh, okay yeah, i see it that's cool yeah, so so check it out later. Yeah. Oh, definitely. All right. So our guest, Mr. Haspiel, has chosen a film for us to dive into. Actually, chosen two, but one to dive deeply into 
is Once Upon a Time in the West. The Widow, the Land Grabber, the Outlaw, <laughs> the Gunman. The Man in Search of a Name. Starring Claudia Cardinale, Henry Fonda, Charles Bronson, and Jason Robards. A Manhunt. A Vendetta. Directed by Sergio Leone, running 165 minutes. A harmonica blowing stranger shows up looking for revenge against gunmen hired by a railroad tycoon to make problems go away. Enter a beautiful woman, made a widow by the gunman, and throw a notorious local outlaw into the mix, and you have the makings of an epic Western tale. So, just to start off, I had not seen this. Neither had I. Oh, see? Hassan, had you seen this before? I, I actually owned it. Yeah, oh, so I've seen it. So, so yes. Oh, you owned it, son. Oh. Uh, yes, yes, my good man. I'm right. <laughs> a connoisseur of many movies. Yes, thank you. I absolutely, absolutely love this movie. Dean made an excellent, excellent choice. Uh, so, Dean, let's. Uh, why, why this movie for you? I it, it was a struggle. I think I've even mentioned to you that the other one I might have picked would be it was one of my favorites is On the Waterfront. Yes, Brando and Eli Kazan and. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bud Schoberg, I think, wrote that. But this movie, not only is a great epic film, but I, I did a little studying of it uh, this week in pre- preparation to talk about it. But I found out that it's actually the first postmodern commentary on the Western, which is interesting because Sergio Leone made three Westerns previous to this, or maybe even four. You know, there's the Dollars Trilogy. There was the He's only he's only made he only directed seven films. Right. So he did a fistful of dollars for a few dollars more. A few followed few few dollars more and the good, the bad, and the ugly. That was one trilogy. He also did yep. a fistful of dynamite, which is a western in a lot of ways. Although, otherwise known as Duck You Duck Sucker. Duck You Sucker. That's right. Yes. Which I which I watched today is after. Oh yeah. Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah, yes. It's great. It, I mean, he's fantastic. And the thing about this movie, and and now with the idea that this is a postmodern commentary. He was a big fan of John Ford, you know, the searchers and 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 those of kinds of westerns, way, you know, the original text of the western, you know. He also was a fan of Kurosawa, which, you know, he has this deliberate way of slowing a scene down and misinforming <laughs> you in a way. And if you think about the introductions of the main characters are phenomenal. The introduction of Bronson's character with those three gunslingers who take over a train station and it becomes this like sonic cinema of just the 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 rusty wheel windmill uh in the in the background creating tension when the train arrives it sounds like darth vader breathing it's huffing and heaving and the way we're introduced to the three characters these gunmen and they're all essential looking there's woody strode who's like won't move from this dripping wet water uh just drip you know that that he drinks you know there's Jack Elam, who has this funky eye, and he won't even move to try to blow this fly away from his face. He traps with a gun. Uh, and there's this other guy who is apparently a Canadian actor whose name escapes me, cracking his knuckles, all creating this tension of like, well, who the hell are they waiting for? You know, like, what is this mission? And then, you know, finally the train arrives. Uh, it doesn't seem like anybody's come. The train pulls away. Like, it's like this pulling of a curtain and we see Bronson, and we hear, and even before that, I think we hear this harmonica sound, but we think it's just a harmonica, it's like music, you know, Ennio Morricone, and then we see, get a close-up, and it's him, he's playing this harmonica, and it's like this weird, like, why is he playing, of course, we find out later, and I don't know how you are about spoilers and stuff, so, in terms of talking about a movie. We generally accept the fact that if, if, we're if talking people have seen the movie, it. I mean, especially about a movie that's, you know, 40 or 50 years old. All right, old, so then I, we'll people... just say right now we'll yeah. probably be spoiling narrative here. Yes. 
that becomes such an incredibly essential scene that I feel like John Woo, you know, uh, is a director who probably watched a lot of Sergio Leone movies where, you know, there's like a musical element or apparently uh, a lot of the movies that the guys who wrote this movie, Once Upon a Time in the West, it was Sergio Leone, Bertolucci, I believe, and Dar Dario Argento yep. Yep. got together to write this. And they looked at a lot of these famous Westerns. And one of the movies that they were influenced by was Johnny Guitar and how the guitar, and in this case, it's a harmonica, you know, and how to use that as, as a, a narrative tool. And then fucking Bronson blows them all away, you know, like he gets winged. <laughs> but, and there's that famous line about how Bronson looks and says, uh, you forgot to bring me a horse or something like that. Uh, what, what's the line? He says, uh, he said, you didn't bring it. You didn't bring a horse for me. And he said, yeah, well, he said, it Where's looks my like horse? we're shy. Jack Elam says, it looks like we're shy one horse. Yeah. Right. And he, said, he says, no, it looks like you brought yeah, two too many. Too many, that's right. <laughs> which is, and there are a lot of lines like that in this movie, Yeah, uh, which is really incredible. And I'll tell you uh, something I just learned for the first time. Alex Cox, the, another great director, Sid and Nancy, Ruth yeah. Man, Straight to Hell, Walker. Uh, he now lives, I believe, in Spain and makes Spanish movies. He heard a rumor that Leone called up uh, Lee Van Cleef, Clint Eastwood, and Eli Wallach and said, hey, you want to get the gang back together in my new movie? And they were like, sure. And it was like, the only thing is you get killed in the first 10 minutes. <laughs> so those would have been those three guys would have been the, the Dollars Trilogy guys, you know, which could have been interesting. But I love... Leone's plan was to have those, the three guys from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly be the three gunmen in the opening sequence. That's the rumor, yeah. yeah. And Eastwood, Eastwood's schedule screwed it up. Oh, that, that's a fact. Out. That is... Yes, that was Leone's plan from the beginning. Oh, wow. After, huh. after, after Eastwood turned down the role of harmonica, he said, well, I want to do this thing with you three at the beginning. Mm. And Eastwood schedule basically wasn't going to allow him to do it. So the whole idea was... Oh, out. well, I still love the guys they got. And they're incredible because no one says anything. They barely have any lines. And yeah. so much text in image. And as a cartoonist, one of the things I love, and, and we'll go through out the movie as I discuss it, like I learned storytelling from this movie. How to how to make a comic just by, you know, going to a, 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 the vista of the geology of a face to the geology of a vista. That was what you know Leone was so good at and storytelling without words. But the words didn't matter really because of what you were looking at and how the pacing of it all. And that, so that we have this great introduction of Bronson. We then meet basically the next introduction is Henry Fonda through this family that we meet literally for a couple of minutes, they get blown away, you know? Yeah. Uh, and a sad scene. <laughs> it's totally sad. And, and strangely tonally off because of the dynamic between the man and his fat and his children. Yes. And then how it shifts. Yes. But then it all comes into context by the end of the scene. Yeah. So that's what Leone <laughs> does is he tells you later. And this happens way late with Jason Robards too. The way Jason Robards, again, spoiler, the way we're introduced to him and the way we find out who he is, which is a great scene, <laughs> and the way he passes away, you're all late to the information. It comes late. And that's part of his, the way he directs and misdirects. So we get Henry Fonda, who apparently showed up knowing he had to play a villain. He, he had a dark mustache, a goatee, and like he had made his blue brown eyes brown context. with brown hair. And Leone said, what are you doing? He's like, what? I'm supposed to play this yeah. bad guy. Uh, they were like, yeah, I, I hired you because you, you're, you're Henry Fonda and everyone's going to be so in shock that yep. you're playing this bad guy. Awesome. And, and then there's that line when they blow away the family except for the young kid. And yeah. he says something like, what do we do about him? What do we do about him? And he says, Frank, what are we going to do about him? He's like, well, now that you said my name. <laughs> yeah. And then the first scene Henry Fonda is, is he kills a child yeah. <laughs> as well. Like... <laughs> He's a bad guy. Yeah. He's a bad guy. In yeah, fact, yeah. I don't think he's ever worse than in that first scene. Because then he kind of plays it a little more like, is he going to take this role of taking over this other guy's job? You know, a yeah. bamboozle. He gets slightly you know. humanized when you put him up against worse guys. Yes. Like, you know, worse individuals. Yes. He's yeah. a little bit, he gets grounded a little bit. Yeah. But he's still bad. He's still a bad yeah, guy. Right. And and the way he <laughs> shot, like his blue eyes really stick out as being eerie. And but Leone knew how to to yeah. light eyes. So holy crap! Like, yeah. yeah, 
to your point, Dean, uh, Henry Fonda actually turned down the role initially, mm. and uh, Leone had to fly to America and meet <laughs> with him and explain why he wanted him to play this part. And AKA, he brought him a bag of money. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well, here part of the story is Fonda was seen as such a good guy actor; he'd never played the the villain, right. and uh, and Leone wanted audiences to have this shock of like his first appearance in the film. You know, he kills this kid. He shoots his kid in the back, and you're like, Henry Fonda, what the hell? Right. And and looking right. for looking for some help with making his decision, he uh, apparently called up Eli Wallach, who was a buddy of his, and asked him about working with Leone. And Wallach told him he he absolutely 100 percent had to do it. He had to take the role. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, wow. "You'll you'll you'll be sorry if you don't, and it'll be an experience that you'll absolutely appreciate." And and Fonda later in his life said that Leone was one of the best directors he mm-hmm. ever worked for. I uh, grow, I grew up at 79th Street in Broadway in Manhattan. And my friend Shannon Goldman, who's also a filmmaker, lived at 90 Riverside Drive on 81st and Riverside. And often I would go and hang out at my buddy Shannon's house and I would get in the elevator and often it'd be Eli Wallach because he lived there too. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. But uh, so apparently when... James Coburn was offered the role of Mallory for Duck You Sucker mm-hmm. or Fistful of Dynamite, if you prefer. Mm. Henry Fonda was actually one of the ones who talked him into taking the role uh, with, with the similar argument saying, right. you've you got to do it. Right. You, right. you, you definitely got to do it. Well, he was such a visual story. I mean, like, I think a lot yes. of artists like and other filmmakers like Leone because of how visual uh, his, his storytelling is. Tarantino obviously does you know, hip checks uh, uh, <laughs> Leone all the time. Um, and again, hip introductions checks. to characters. <laughs> you know, when we meet Claudia... Cardinal. 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 You know, did you read about what the first shot was supposed to be when we meet her? No. <laughs> and she she got interviewed and, and, and the other writers were like, yeah, this was, was what he pitched to her. And she's like, no. Because she plays a former whore that becomes a wife, you know, and then she's really right. kind of like a mother figure in this story in a lot of ways that all the men love, but they treat her uh, accordingly. When she gets off the train, the, sh- the camera was supposed to be, was supposed to be under her skirt. Yeah. And reveal that she's not wearing knickers, which is like, are yes. you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be the first shot, you know, like, come on. Awesome. And so everyone's like, no, 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 no. And then she comes and arrives in the, in this great shot, this crane shot, where she gets off the train. No one's there to greet her. So she has this person to help her with her bags, go into a train station. She walks out, and the camera lifts up. And you see what I can only imagine now is this town that's emerging. It's being created. And it kind of reminded me of Deadwood in that way. You know how yeah. the, the, the yeah. TV show was a lot about this emerging town, you know, yeah. um, and all the people who, who make it happen. Funny tidbit, the set. For Flagstone City cost more than the budget for a fistful of dollars. That's right. That's right. I read that. Yeah. <laughs> Which is bananas because they don't use it a lot in the movie. <laughs> right. In fact, you know, a lot of the movie is shot in Spain, but some of it was shot where John Ford shot his movies in America. Monument Valley. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They did travel there. And they had to, they actually imported some of the red sand and dust mm-hmm. to <laughs> kind of spread it around in spots in Spain, you know, because Spain is all very yellow. <laughs> but uh yeah but anyway so then we get to so claudia finds out her husband and family's been murdered massacred but she has this she has water water is such a key to this story like in the middle of this kind of desert there's this gold and the gold is water you know and then she decides to go to a bar because she wants to take a bath or something at this kind of like you know kind of a cantina like you know, the Star yeah. Wars cantina with all the miscreants <laughs> and everything. And then while there, another great storytelling moment is she's in there talking to the bartender, a guy that was on a TV show. He, apparently he was blacklisted from Hollywood, which is why he was in Spain making movies. I forget his name right oh, now. Man. He was the he was the butler on a TV show to a main character and something. I can't. I know Ma- you're talking Max. about. His name was Max, I think. I don't remember, but yeah. he, he recognized the guy from TV. Yes. So yeah. she, while she's there... You hear uh, a horse carriage pull up outside. You hear fist fight, guns. Then you hear like bodies hitting the ground. (laughs) And you're like, what has just happened out there? And then slowly the doors swing open and there's Jason Robards. And he slowly walks up to the bar 
and he wants a what a casket of whiskey or whatever and the bartender hands it to him and that's when you reveal he pulls up the bottle of whiskey and you see his hands are handcuffed right, yeah what the yeah, fuck yeah. he just <laughs> Who did he just kill, like, with handcuffs right. on, right? I mean, great <laughs> right. storytelling because you learn, you, you, you know everything you, you need to know right now about how terrifying this man is. Right. But he turns out to be a sweetheart, a man, you know, man with, like, if she's a, a whore with a heart, heart of gold, he's like a gunslinger with a heart of gold, you know, kind well, of. Well, what's so funny about that is, is they reveal that, and it's like he throws away an entire action sequence set piece because you, you don't need it. You don't. Because actually, in your imagination, now that the reveal, yeah. you think, "What just happened out there?" Like, it, do you don't? And you're like, "Oh, yes, yes, okay." And then he meets now Bronson, and Bronson's always kind of like hiding, you know, like a mystic in in the sides <laughs> of things. And then he gets his, you know, handcuff blown off. And then I feel like there's one more. I guess the other kind of reveal. It's not a reveal, but a character that's kind of important to the story is, and I forget the character name, but he's the guy who's. Uh, basically creating the the railroad right and he wants to have access to the ocean the, the tycoon the tycoon the one with yes. tuberculosis. And it's fascinating the yes. guy with yeah tuberculosis yes he had tuberculosis and he is basically in this moving wheelchair of a train that also has a cage for him to be able to walk yeah, around that was a cool and thing. and what an incredible like I, we were talking about split before, but like you know, maybe who could they have pissed off back in nineteen <laughs> was it sixty nine? Yeah. You know, or sixty eight? Yeah, right. People that had to wear body braces. That's right. And <laughs> to me, sure, it was a business decision and a dream to create a railroad, like which is the new technology. Back then, that train was the internet. You know, if you think about yeah. it. Yeah. 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 This new technology going from you know dry land to the ocean. And later on, when he's basically, there's this like massacre that's happened that we didn't see happen. And he's kind of dying, again, spoilers. Yeah. What I love is that he's near this like puddle, right? Yeah. And I kept thinking, oh, he wants to be in the ocean because you, you become free of your shackles. You become free of your restraints and your inability and your handcuff. You could just float in the water too. You know, that's not said in the movie, but to me that right. was inferred, you know, like, Right. Oh, he really needs to be in water. His how his dream had started with his view of the Atlantic Ocean. He wanted to end it with a view of the Pacific. That's, that's right. And it, as he's dying, uh, the sound is that of the ocean. Uh, yeah, you know, which is yeah, the of, wind blowing across the the prairie or whatever. That's right. Yeah. He's by yeah, water. So he's by a puddle. He's just not by. The yeah, that, yep. it's like it, just as an insult, he dies next to a a, a muddy puddle. a muddy puddle. <laughs> that's right. Um, but I feel like often when you see like you know. Uh, a, like a movie like this, a spaghetti western, you know, you, you're going in for, at least with Leone, he trains you to watch his, his the buildup. It's never the gunshots. It's the buildup. Yeah. It's the tension that he oh, creates. Yeah. And then when the gun happens, it's so quick, it's over, right? It doesn't really matter. It's all, and again, that's something that Tarantino likes to do, you know, and it, yeah, in, yeah. Uh, but in that's his, also a Kurosawa thing. Absolutely. About, like, you know, there, there's no prolonged sword fights in any of his movies, you know, right. it's all. It's all getting yeah. there. Yeah, it's all the action there. is always always momentary, but the but the the pacing is what right. gets you. Yeah, you know? and I love that. Like, so you need a backstory, right? You need to have the thing that people are somehow connecting and crossing over. And I thought, what a beautiful kind of backstory! This railroad, this this new technology, this you know, this idea that water is gold. You know, or it was called sweet water was the name of that yeah. area. You know. Um, and also, it was his first attempt to try to write a female protagonist that wasn't a prop. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah and I it. thought that he did, you know, for back then in those, those times, I thought he did a pretty good job. And there's this beautiful moment that for the first time seeing this movie, after so many years seeing this over and over again, for the first time, I actually cried last night <laughs> from this movie <laughs> where... Jason Robards is hiding the fact that he's been shot and is dying. We don't know that. Uh, when that comes up at the end, you're like, what? Wait, he just had a whole thing. That's right. Where he was like at the house shaving. So when like, you rewatch it, he's preparing yeah. himself for death. Uh, he's yeah. trying to be a good guy. And I love that he has that moment with her when he's looking at all the men that are working really hard on this town. And, and, and she's like, you know, you're so beautiful. It wouldn't hurt if you just went out there and showed your face. And they would love you if you just brought them water. And then he adds that little moment. And if they 
tap you on the ass, just let it slide. <laughs> like kind and of then thing. he does it. Yeah. <laughs> and, then he... and then he does it. And then she yeah. does go out there to honor this. And it's this yeah, beautiful yeah. moment. I started to get emotional because these men really needed this beautiful face to give them water, you know, like, yeah. and, and this town is going to, pro to be made and prevail. And, and then, you know, Bronson goes off taking Cheyenne was his name. I believe yeah. Jason Robards yeah. character's name was Cheyenne. Uh, we, you know, you, you, Oh my God. Like the big reveal, the harmonica is unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. You, know? you finally, you finally get to it. It's like, Oh, so I've been doing too on. much talking. I want to hear what you guys thought, especially the, the newbies. Uh, uh, well, I mean, so I have a, I have a whole list of, of tidbits and things about fact, more facts kind of stuff mm -hmm. about, uh, uh, the films, but a couple of personal things that I noticed, I thought that the, of course, the music, of course, Morricone is, is always going to be brilliant, but I thought that it was funny that the thing that kept kind of ringing in my head is Cheyenne's theme or the theme they used for him or the music they always started playing when it was, when he was around. It really reminded me of the music that they used for the incidental music throughout the Sherlock Holmes, the Robert Durney Sherlock Holmes film, that sort huh. of clinking guitar sound. And if you go back sure, and listen sure. to the soundtrack for that, it just, it, for, it, it instantly rang a bell for me. Yeah. And I was one, and I had to like go and like start looking around online to see if maybe that actually was an inspiration. It I probably think that's a was. form of banjo. I think that's a, that's a, was it a banjo? That's a species of banjo. Hmm. There's, okay. there's several kinds. Hmm. But I think that that plucking sound, you're yeah. talking about that, you know, yeah. Yeah, that. Bing, 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 yeah. Bing, bing, yeah. Bing, bing. I and, do and, believe that is a banjo. And did you notice? Because now I'm noticing more things because I was going to talk about it. But the theme, Cheyenne's theme, uh, there's a pause yeah. that happens. Whereas like, yes. and then there's a pause, and that they kept using that. And actually, in the pause is when he slumps <laughs> over dead. <laughs> And yeah, then the music continues. You know, <laughs> it's jarring. And it was just like they, very jarring. It was so yeah, yeah. Well, it was really funny. Is uh, Morricone works so fast, and so so the first draft of this script was apparently four hundred and thirty six pages, mm. uh, which of which of course was untenable. Mm. Um, and so when they finally got to their their first really trimmed down version, and they sent it to Morricone to start working on the score when they started shooting. Well, Morricone f had finished the score when he only had about half the movie shot or a little more than half the movie shot. So basically the music was done and they ended up changing and, you know, removing some parts of the story and, and changing others as they went. And Leone ended up shooting in some sequences to fit the music. Okay. Hmm. So Tarantino recently revealed that he'll – before he writes his movie, when he's just getting, again, I sorry to keep up bringing Tarantino, but this is where, again, he's such yeah. a Leone head. And he, so I was surprised to hear that he'll like create, he'll just create a whole box of music for the movie he's going to, and then yes. he'll shoot scenes to the length sometimes of a song, you know, <laughs> yeah. and figure out the beats and everything because of the song he's definitely going to use. Yep. And then when I heard that about Leone, and I think I had also read that as well, I was like, oh, wow, because that scene when she gets off the train, there's no one there to pick her up. She goes into the, to the station and then the camera and the crane. It's all to the music. The, the, yeah, it's the all music. There's no dialogue, right? That's right. That's right. And then again, for a guy who is very judicious about his, um, the amount of dialogue he uses, because the text is in the pictures. You know, it's in the, it's in the performance. It's in the expressions of the faces. There's more text happening there than when people speak. So that would make yeah. sense for a guy who's so visual and cares about the sound that music would play a character, you know, in, in helping oh, dictate absolutely. the narrative. Yeah. So. So another note I have is I thought that every, literally every single minute of screen time with Henry Fonda is cinematic gold. Mm -hmm. I just, I found, I found that by about the second hour of the movie, like literally every time he, he stepped into frame, <laughs> I was just, I was absolutely in love with this movie just to be able to watch him in this role in this film. Yeah. I think, you know, Leone had said that harmonica, the part of harmonica was written for Eastwood. And when Eastwood turned him down, uh, not wanting to continue working with Leone and just kind of get back to America and get back into the swing of his, his, his career. Swing literally. Cause then he, 
act with monkeys, you know? <laughs> yeah. that, that, would come a, that, that would come a little later, yeah. Okay. Um, and apparently that, that, that broke that relationship between mm. him and Leone for a lot of years. Mm. And it wasn't until many years later, Clint was in Italy doing press for a movie he directed. And Leone called him out of the blue and they ended up having dinner together. Mm. And uh, Leone actually passed away a few months later. So, oh, man. what caused him yeah, to fall pretty, out? Pretty Sorry, the the fact that uh, that Eastwood just flat turned him down. Oh, yeah. Uh, just just and just saying, I don't want to do. I don't want to. Busy. It, though, I understand I he was probably saying. Was he busy? Well, I and I understand that it was more a case of it's not that I don't want to work with you. It's I don't want to work with you because I want to go home. I want to go back right. to America. Right. I want to go back to Hollywood and that. And way he was things. probably done with the western thing it, correct you know? correct he'd done he'd made his mark you know i think that you know he'd kind of said all he had to say on the matter you know at that yeah to do the dirty dozen man and that's right uh -huh. I, I read somewhere uh that leone purposely would put clint eastwood would shoot him with the sun glaring in his eyes yes yeah, because so because he would squint and look really fucking cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah so and clint after all is like what why do you keep doing that he's like you just look better, man. You just <laughs> you look really cool with your eyes squinting like that. You know, like Trust me. you know, he's a very character-based filmmaker. So. Yeah, uh, I thought Bronson was an amazing choice for this. I think that if Eastwood had taken this, had taken the role, I don't know how. I mean, clearly it would have been good. Don't get me wrong. I think it would have been an entirely different feel. Uh, I think. Well, you would have I think. Known. Well, I think Eastwood is too good looking for this role. And I also think he was too tall. It was it was nice to have Bronson in that role, because I feel yep. like it needed a smaller, less of, like a normal looking guy in that role, and just be you know have him show up. Yes. He's not flashy. He doesn't stand out, but he is also for the ambiguity because the whole yeah. beginning of the film is ambiguous, right? You don't know who's yeah. doing what right. or whatever. If Eastwood sh showed up, it's like all right, there's a good. Oh, it's guy. a man with you no name. I mean? No matter. Yeah, exactly. Even, he's got a harmonica yeah, now. Yeah, no matter how, no matter what role he would play, he's gonna be the protagonist yeah. as far as you're concerned, you know. So, right. at least Bronson was like, right. "All right, what's what's up with this guy?" You know. So, so yeah, Eastwood Eastwood would have changed the whole movie. Would and it was yeah, you're right. It was still would have been good, but it would have probably lost a little of the what the f quality mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that you, it has in the very beginning. Right. Like, what the hell is happening? Yep. One thing I was interested in, in watching this movie, I, I, I got really interested to see who the cinematographer was. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was a guy named Tonino Delacoli, mm -hmm. and he also shot Good and the Bad, the Ugly. And I was like, okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, he did not shoot the first two, mm -hmm. but he shot, he shot GBU in this one. And, and I, I, I think that Good, the Bad, and the Ugly and this film together make a perfect combination of films as far as the genre is concerned. Mm -hmm. The one thing, the question I have is, why did he take Cheyenne's body with him at the end? That's the only question I wrote out at the end, at the end of the movie. That's the only question I really have is, why, why did he take Cheyenne's body with oh, him? Oh, that's easy. He was going to reanimate him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, silly, silly, <laughs> silly fucking me. He's going to bury him somewhere. That's what I think. He's going to bury him. He's going to honor him. I think, you know, there's this uh, Jewish thing. When, when my buddy Seth Kushner passed away, and the family was very Jewish, one thing that I, I didn't know about is that everyone takes turn putting the dirt back onto his casket yep. because the last thing you can give your friend or your loved one is to be able to bury them in a way, you know? And, and I okay. feel like, not that it was a Jewish thing in, <laughs> in the movie, right. but he's honoring, he's going to go honor him. Instead of leaving him slumped on the side, he's going to go bury him. He's going to go honor his, you know? Gotcha. His, okay. So, yeah. I mean, how do you even end that movie? You know, how do you end I mean, this? It's basically movie? over the right. credits too. I mean, it's basically yeah. you see him slowly going off, and credits yeah. are rolling. And, yeah. I mean, there is no way to end it besides you know the slow fade out on that. I mean, That's I mean, right. Leone is the Leone is the master of the of that long shot where it's just it's just a shot either either from uh, height or from distance and just holding a position, right? And just letting it play out in front of you, and you keep expecting either a fade or a cutaway because that's what that's what you do that's what directors do it fades to black mm. as the guy is riding away no mm. it just stays on him for the next like three and a half minutes 
and just know, riding up, right, getting further and further <laughs> away until the until the the yeah. Paramount logo comes up, and you're just like, yep. you know, and and that's all the time, you know. I mean, if you yeah watching these movies the way I have, you know, not having seen them a long time ago, but now kind of having a uh, crash course in Leone, I, I find it absolutely fascinating visually. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think if I'd have seen these when I was younger, I don't think I. I, I know I would not have appreciated them as much as I do now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know, Latham, you, you listed your favorite Western is Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So how did you... Uh... It still is, yeah. Okay. So... Uh... <laughs> oh, I, that's, not, that's not saying I didn't like this. No, I understand. I, 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 liked, I liked it a lot. There's all these pop culture things that popped up while I was watching it, and some were personal. The, the opening scene, how long it took at the train station was great but the whole scene with the flop I, I all i could think about was yeah. how did they orchestrate this did, did they just like wait till a fly started bothering him did they release a fly near him and they just, rubbed a thin film of jam on elam's face is that true yeah. yes uh, i mean that's great that's brilliant and then waited and waited for a fly to show up. I, I mean it just it just that's why he looked so flat by the time it's yeah. probably like four hours later when it actually happened. <laughs> that, yeah, there's probably a, an outtake where someone just licks it off his face or something. That, uh. The jam that they put on there. Uh. It, that, that was very auteurish. That's like, you know, I, I've only seen, how many Leone films have I seen? I think that's my third. Mm. So just seeing his style, like all over that first scene, I, I, I really like that. I like the story. I... I really think this movie is carried by the four main characters. They're all just, they have that star look that even in today's movie world, you know, it seems to escape a lot of, you know, there's not many star vehicles per se. And this one was like not even a star vehicle so much as Henry Fonda was in it. Charles Bronson had just started his career. Am I correct? Or was this one of his first films or midway? That I don't I mean, know. I mean, he's, I think he'd done some movies. Done something. He'd done some stuff. I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't know in what order. Uh, he was recognizable, though. Like, people knew who he was when this I think so. came out, I would guess. Yeah. So him yeah. and Jason Rohards. Yeah, he had, yeah. Been, he had been acting since 49. Oh, I was, okay, yeah. my bad then. Yeah, so and anyway, I mean, it. he was perfect. But anytime you focus on those three guys' faces, I mean, they command, you know, they command the screen and, you know, I'm sorry, but this, what's her name? Cla Claudia Cardinal. I mean, my goodness, just yep. the mo one of the most strikingly beautiful women yep. I've ever seen. And anytime she's on, you're just, you know, you're, you're focused on her. That's right. She reminded, she reminded me of the bad uh, villainess in the James Bond movie Thunderball. That was the only mm -hmm. like redhead of that kind of beauty mm -hmm. that I could compare her to. But, I mean, that choice is important because that role, you know, you're not thinking about her as a whore, that whole movie. Right. That's almost like a sidebar. That's right. And that's tough to pull off, and she nailed yep. it. I'm astounded that this film had no Academy Award nominations, none, zero. I mean, cinematography, yeah. uh, the acting, I, I just well, it's I just technically don't a foreign it. film, though. That's how they would have considered it you know, for the most part, right? That's true. That's true. But they've nominated other people for acting roles in foreign films too. Or or how about best foreign film? I mean, yeah. our, our, our best picture nominees that year, the Romeo and Juliet movie. I mean... That's mm -hmm. Zeffirelli's? Yeah. Ugh. I mean, I, yeah, I don't... I mean, this, this... I'll tell you what this... I'll compare this to. A, a few... About a month ago, before we even started doing this podcast... I was watching old movies I had not seen and always wanted to. One of them was Days of Heaven. Have any of you seen Days of Heaven? I have. No, yeah. but I, I've been meaning to. Been okay. Meaning to. So Days of Heaven, I think, is a little overrated because it's almost just a, a lyrical, you know, just a poem with a lot of visuals, and the story isn't that interesting. This was what Days of Heaven should have been. It was more interesting because there was an actual really interesting plot and more just better dialogue and better ways of conveying the themes behind it. And well, compelling, compelling characters that intersect and the way we meet these characters, we cling to them now, 
you know? For sure. Uh, All four of the main ones. Un- yeah. And the score, I mean, and maybe Steve will concur with me here, Dean maybe too, depending on what he likes, but I, I'm hearing it, it felt like I was listening to parts of The Empire Strikes Back at times. I mean, mm-hmm. I heard like mm-hmm. cues that were very similar. <laughs> And that made me happy, obviously, because that's my favorite score of all time. And <laughs> I just think it, it was a, it must have been ahead of its time, I'm guessing. Uh, but again, it wasn't nominated for anything. Well, I, I would I would hazard because and I'm sure other movies have done this where each character gets their own theme. But I, I remember distinctly in Orson Welles' Touch of Evil that the, the different characters, Marlena Dietrich, Charlton Heston, uh, the main characters all had their own theme songs as well. Yes. And and that's maybe a choice, obviously, and it also makes it distinctive, especially when you do a sweeping, a, lo- a big movie. Sometimes it's a it's a, a good audio cue to tell us where we are and who we are with. Sometimes. Yes, great, great point. And I, I guess the only question I had, maybe I missed the plot point while watching it. Didn't didn't Bronson get shot in the first scene? Yeah. And he note, and then what what is done or said about that? Just nothing. Other than Robard gets- pointing it out later, nothing. And there's also a moment uh, for about three or four scenes, there's a cut under Bronson's eye. Yes. That is not addressed. <laughs> right. And yeah. it, it apparently in that cantina that I point out or whatever that is, there had been a brawl or something before that, but they cut out that scene and they shot it and filmed it. And then he suddenly has a cut under his eye. So not only has he been shot, and then later on we see a cut for no reason. But yeah, you're right. He never really... It's fine. But he also doesn't do much. He doesn't do much, Bronson. He 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 helps um, Henry Ford kill a bunch of guys so he can kill him himself later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so he's just pointing things out and pointing one gun, but he's not like jumping around being nuts, you know. Uh, he's almost a MacGuffin. Yes. The shot almost. of them showing his the the bullet hole, though, it reminded me of the shot at the end when they showed Cheyenne's bullet hole. It was almost right. like the same reveal. That's why I thought I had missed something. I thought they were comparing the two, but obviously mm. they didn't. Uh, mm. They didn't address it or no. They don't really. They don't really. Just maybe tough. maybe just a tough dude. You could take it. <laughs> yeah, look at him. Take one look at him, man. It's I, mean, Bronson. I, mean, I would shoot him more than once. You know, I would just shoot him once. I'd shoot that guy That's like right. eight times or something. That's right. And probably in That's the right. And then the shoot last... eight times with a six shooter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or stop and reload. The other, the other two are random sound effects that happen to him too. Yeah. Uh, and the last thing I'd say was I, I just, you know, I always remember years of films and timelines, and you know, the way Henry Fonda looks in this, and then. 12 years later, he's doing On Golden Pond at the end of his life. And 12 I just think, years? Yeah. 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 On Golden Pond was 1980. Yeah. This was 68. So Jesus yeah. Christ. Holy crap. So he, he accelerated. His, I mean, he, did look, he looked great in it. So. That was my first Fonda movie. Great, but he was yeah. older. On Golden Pond. He was, I'm sorry, yeah, he, Dean, no, what was that? No, I was going to say he was definitely older than the character he was playing oh, in okay. Once Upon a Time so in the So they West. Made, him, made him younger. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and Hassan, that was your first Fonda movie yeah. on Golden Pot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a. It was first. I'm like, you know, and I'm like, what's with this? You know, everybody's because t- uh, it was on HBO or something like that, and they have talk. I mean, obviously, the perspective of that film, it's like from the kid's perspective, especially when I was young, the kid who goes to stay with his his the grandparents or whatever, and uh, I just remember all the the uh, the average the advert to whatever for it was like Henry Fonda. And I'm like, what the hell, the hell is that guy? <laughs> what, no, I, have not, I have not seen that movie. Why is this guy so important? I've got to see on Golden Pond. It's funny. It's, the, uh, one of the first pornos I ever saw was on Golden Blonde. So. <laughs> ah, very good. Here I was thinking I had brought us down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. We can always Steve, go a little Steve bit Steve comes lower. in with the rescue. So, Okay. <laughs> That's right. And he, uh, that's, right. that's the only best actor he won was for On Golden Pond. That's, that's right. The first time he won, the only time he won. That's and it. then he, he died two years later. Yeah. You know? But yeah, so overall, I, you know, I liked it. I, I, as Hassan and Steve know my rating scale now, I gave it three and a four. Okay. All right. And, and what's the highest rating? Well, above four is the greatest. Yeah. So yeah. No, no, I'm saying what, yeah. how is high as you four. get? Four, How, four, four is the highest. Four, okay. For a select few, go go above that, but yeah. Yeah. So, so if you revisit this movie later, it's only going to get better. I know that's You'll what see. excites You'll me, see. especially by your testimony. 
Yeah, man. It's fantastic. It won't be so the Hassan, last time I watch it. That's for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Hassan, revi- revisiting it? Uh, I like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly a little better than this one. Okay. And the first time I watched it, because I, I saw it on Bravo. I saw it. I caught the end of it on Bravo. The Bravo channel like years ago. I'm like, oh, man, this is fantastic. Then I bought it. And boy, I had to have bought it maybe 15 years ago. I mean, I've had that DVD. It was—it's a DVD. It's not a Blu-ray. It's—it's it's one of those clunky, big box DVDs with like yeah. four discs in it for all the special features and everything. That's how—that's how far back it was. So me going into it again today, and it was today. It was the first time in a long time. It's like a revisit. I thought it. I wish I—I I really wish I was watching it without without being without scrutinizing it. I just wish I was just mm-hmm. sitting into it instead of like, okay, I got to go over this material again to, you know, reacquaint myself with it because <laughs> I, uh, I, I forgot what was going on. I forgot what the, the premise was until about maybe an hour and 10 minutes in. And then I remembered everything, but it was almost like I spoiled it for myself by remembering exactly <laughs> how it all was going to turn out. And I was so Your mad. Mine failed you. Yeah, <laughs> it did. It, was, it failed me in the beginning, which was good. And then it booted, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, that's, um, <laughs> I, I found it I, as I, as I had found it the first time I saw it a little, a little disjointed um, in comparison with some of it, like uh, Leone's, Movies are always very quiet, and very like like everyone has been saying here. They are quiet, and there's always they're always slow building. But this one was so like spacious, you know. This one is you know we you just everybody's ambiguous. Everybody you know, and like I had said before, the 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 tonal strangeness of the father and the family that he that Leone bothers to three try to three dimensionalize before they all get blown away, which in my in my reviewing of it today was a couple came as a complete shock to me. Like, Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> I thought we were going to follow. <laughs> I thought at least a kid. Okay. The kid's alive. Okay. So no, no, we're not following the kid either. <laughs> but I, I, it kind of felt like the good, the bad and the ugly light to me in, in my opinion. Now I think it, it, it is brilliantly put together. I'm really glad that Eastwood and uh, Lee Van Cleef and uh, and Eli. Well, I'm glad that they weren't the three guys at the station in the beginning because yeah. it kind of would have been a gimmick. It, yeah, it would, exactly. Thank you. Um, it would have been too gimmicky, and it would have been, been a nice. So far ahead of its time, though. It would have been. It definitely <laughs> would have been. But I think it would have confused everybody since no one was doing stuff like that. Yeah. You know. I agree. But now would we we'd be talking about it as a gimmick now, Steve? Back yes. then it would have been fine. Yes. Now, <laughs> would be now would be a gimmick. To speak to Hassan about about his reaction to this. Oh, uh, he's gonna he's gonna take me to task. <laughs> me? Yeah. Oh no no no. You sir. I say what, what... <laughs> no no no. I think you're partially responding to, I think because again this is how I'm responding and is that when I realized that it was his postmodern take on the Western, after kind of reinventing the Western, now he was commenting on it by flipping the script and all these characters. It, it, it does take a longer time to get into, because you said the word ambiguous, and that's a perfect word to discover. And it's kind of out of context, though, ambiguous. because I'm coming into Leone for the first time in a long time with this movie, which is pretty much at the end or mm. towards the end of his western you know uh legacy right so mm-hmm. it's kind of like mm-hmm. starting all the clint eastwood movies with unforgiven you know and it's it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, he's doing a referendum or something like that you might want to call it on his le- on his legend that's a good way but you it. don't but you don't really get it because you're just watching it as a movie and i'll say this too uh he, i think the reason why i brought in the other guys to write it with him is because uh, the producers, the people with money were like, could you make another one, please? Make another Western. Western. And he wanted to go make Once Upon a Time in America. <sighs> and so in order to do that, he had to make this movie. And so he was like, what do I make? And that's why he featured a protagonist female and yeah, he- decided, you know what? I'm going to change the way the killer is and make him make... Uh, Jason, I'm going to hire Jason Robards, a very kind looking man yeah. to play kind of a bad guy, but he's a bad guy with a heart of gold, you know, and 
Bronson who played the man with no name, you know, but with this tragic, you know, uh, secret. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and cast a really good, like known to be a really nice guy. As a bad guy. A good, flip everything on his as head. A bad guy. He was flipping everything on his head. Because he was probably bored. He was probably yes. bored with the template, the Western template, you know? Yes. So he just, in order yes. for him to stay interested, he threw everything, right. you know, he threw everything haywire. I will say also, right. uh, watching it on, when I had first caught it on Bravo, and I was, I was, I was really enjoying it, and I uh, checked, because back then, there was no, it was, it were, there was internet, but there were no uh, d- digital devices where you could just check things instantly. I checked to see the, the, the title of the film, I fell in love with the film because of the title. Something about mm. the simplicity of Once Upon a Time in the West, mm-hmm. for some reason, just just completely, uh, completely burned in my brain. Like it's like this. Mm-hmm. That is the greatest title to you know. I would watch a movie called Once Upon a Time in the West anytime it came on. Like you know, it's yeah. my version of Roadhouse. Yeah. But <laughs> I mean, any movie that starts with Once Upon a Time in Yes, I mean they're all they're all great. I, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. except for the most recent one. But um, oh. Oh, stop it! Stop! Stop! Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be Hot quiet. takes it. Hot takes it. <laughs> I think it's I, up and to I, us. I, did. I think it's up to us to create Once Upon a Time in Space. It's Once Upon a Time in Space. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yeah, it's uh, called. I am. Moonlaker. I am. Yeah. Stop! <laughs> what are you doing, Nathan? Come on! I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you doing to me? I'm, inter- I'm interrupting your take. <laughs> no, I apologize. Oh, that was my first Moonraker. Is my first James Bond movie. Mm-hmm. My mom took me to shut me up because there was space in it. <laughs> right. And then I had the nerve to say uh, the Roger Moore was better than Connery to her, and that was. Mm. I, and that oh, was no. your last James Bond. Yes, movie. <laughs> I think that. Well, that was our last conversation on the subject for certain. <laughs> But uh, to bring it back, yeah, I mean, also, I, I, I watched uh, Once Upon a Time in America. I, that's, another, that's another really great epic. But it, in my opinion, the yep. pacing is just off on it. Like, certain mm-hmm. things happen. Like, if you watch um, The Outlaw Josie Wales, everything happens on a beat. You know, it's very American. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a beat. You know, this yeah. and beat. Act this, act this. But the reason I like that so much is because he knew his iconography so well. And he knew how to use it really well. So that it all kind of, you know, it, it, he knew how to legend build. And uh, mm-hmm. there, was an, there was not a lot of ambiguity in, uh, in Josie Wales, like Bronson, mm-hmm. where, you know, there's an almost rape scene. And there's a, you know, there's, yep. a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, moral yep. flexibility in the, in the yes. entire thing. So it was, yep. it, it, it was an experience. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. As a Leone movie, I think The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is, and then, and then again, is a, a nostalgia thing because my mom sat me, okay, I'm going to show you The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. You know, and, and again, again, a great title. Another great title. It, you can't beat that no, title. No, you yeah. can't. And they never have, and they never will. Yep. You know, it's. Nope. Yep. Uh, uh, the experience, because it reminded me so much of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. You know, it reminded me of that first, because that was my first Western. My mom's like, I'm going to yep. shit you down and you're going to watch The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I, found it, I found the movie a little scary, you know, as a, as a child. <laughs> I mean, it really did, especially the, his theme. His theme is to a kid mm-hmm. that, you know, people mm-hmm. moaning in the desert. <laughs> yeah. Ah, you know, that, yeah, <laughs> that scared yeah. the hell out of you. So <laughs> watching this again, I had, you know, I had so many mixed feelings seeing this movie today again, that I don't really know where, where it lands. But, I, yeah, but I, listening yeah. to you talk about it, and you actually contextualize it much better than I was able to while I was watching it, and I'm just coming fresh mm-hmm. off of it. And I'm going to watch it again probably tomorrow to, you cool. know, just, to, just to go over it and actually appreciate the points that, that you guys made. Um, I, I really like it. I still like The Good, Bad, and the Ugly a little better, but I, sure, I, I sure. think it's a really powerful movie, and I, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, I'm glad you guys watched it and, and uh, you know, revisited it, and then you guys watched it for the first time. And it, it, I mean, listen, you can't really go wrong with Leone. And like you said, he's only made like seven movies, and they're all worth watching over and over again. Absolutely. You know? He's a great storyteller, great filmmaker, and he cares about character so much yeah the know? one i'm really interested in is, the, is his first film uh colossus of Rhodes. 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I, 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 I'm going to check it out at some point, but I feel like that was he, – he hadn't developed his sensibility necessarily right. that's yet. What made, that's what I'm so interested in. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but, I mean, he worked for – I mean, he worked from 46 until 75 as an assistant and second unit director – uh, and films, and he worked on. I mean, he he, he worked on ben, sword and sandals. Sword yeah, and sandals. He, was a, he worked on Ben Hur. A, a lot of sword and sandals. He was a second unit director on right. Ben Hur. Wow. Yeah. John Landis was an uncredited stuntman on this film. What? What? <laughs> yep. Okay. The director. Yeah. He's the guy who fell uh, on the clock. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. No. <laughs> No. Every time they showed anyone That's... with a mustache, I was like dying. I'm like, there is is. Oh, <laughs> I know who he was. He's the guy that got hit by the helicopter blade. And that oh, one's yeah, oh, that's oh, right. Too uh, soon. Lathan. That's right. Too soon. That was like 30 years Lathan. ago. Oh, Tell that to Jennifer Jason Lee. Uh, oh, oh, boy. Ah, oh, taking us down. What didn't Vic Morrow leave her one dollar? Yeah, something. Will? Yeah. Something insane yeah Something some insulting. uh two two last little bits of trivia um so jill's theme the theme that they play when she shows up at the train station and that for that whole sequence uh so apparently john carpenter played that music uh when he walked down the aisle with adrian barbeau when they got married wow. no way yep awesome awesome that's wow. the music he played pretty neat and uh the mcbain farmhouse did it look familiar to anybody no but i'll tell you the trivia go ahead well, I'll just say two two words. Orson Welles. Nope. Oh. Oh. Uh, you don't know the trivia. Then. Oh, I have different trivia. You tell me. So you, the, tell the me house. Yours. Well, the Sweetwater House was built from leftover wood from an Orson Welles movie that was shot like right before that movie was shot, and they just left it there. And I don't remember the name of the movie that Orson Welles did. I think Probably it was like some medieval one. movie or something. And uh, so that was just repurposed. And built into that Sweetwater house. So, oh, that's cool trivia. So that house was next seen on film. Oh, in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Come on! Oh wow, that's that's where they. Uh, that's Come his. On. That's his farm. That's his farmhouse. Yep. Or, that's that's, wow. the, that's yeah. Whose farmhouse? That's great. Which? Uh, well, in Indiana, where he lived. That's what I was trying ah! to figure out. It's, yeah. Ah! Wow. <laughs> I just broke us on. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Hassan. As long as you still don't like Crystal Skull, it's okay. <laughs> Loved Crystal Skull. Oh, boy. Wait, what was his and son's I'm name? Not ashamed. Junior. 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 <laughs> Henry. Junior. Henry Jones <laughs> Junior. 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 Uh, Count to twenty. Steve, if you we, could, we named the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. We named the dog Indiana. <laughs> Oh well, I think I think we have uh, I think we've all uh, Hassan has broken his camera. <laughs> have we beaten a dead horse? Were you going to use that? Uh, I'm, I'm, I've just left. I'm not coming back. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Hassan has left the building. I'm boycotting. I'm boycotting the show <laughs> while I'm on the show. Yes, the most efficient um, way to cancel something is just to just do, do it while time. you're. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I will comment, but you will not see me. <laughs> Uh, so as a, uh, as a little added bonus, uh, we asked our guest for a what we consider a guilty pleasure film. Uh, and that's a film that he or she likes to watch, uh, enjoys for whatever reason that may be, and yet understands objectively that that film is generally probably considered not great. Um, and so Dean has given us uh, the film Tourist Trap from 1979, directed by David Schmoller. Runs 90 minutes. Um, a group of friends headed out for a beach getaway, get sidetracked, and end up trapped in a dilapidated roadside attraction with a killer with a special talent that only wants to add them to his mannequin collection. <laughs> um, I, For those of you who don't know, I am a tremendous uh, horror fan. I'll watch any horror movie, good or bad, doesn't matter. Um, since most of them are bad, that's, <laughs> that's pretty, pretty much going to make some good. You can... You can usually find uh, some saving grace in almost any movie, uh, whether it be one line of dialogue or one, one the director lucks into one good shot, um, one good concept, idea, et cetera. Uh, and for that, for me, usually the payoff is, is, is worth time spent. Um, Dean, what's, uh, what's the story with this movie? 
So, did you all watch it, or did some of you skip it, or what? I watched it. I didn't skip it, but I didn't get a chance to finish it. So, got it. Okay. But I, we, so, we spoil away. <laughs> there's not much to spoil because <laughs> it's not a very good movie. Um, and it's what you think it is. It's exactly what you think it is. And to me, I was trying to figure out what was my innate. I'm actually scared. This movie scares me. And I think it's because I'm terrified of mannequins. That would make sense. And I'm terrified of things that kind of come to, you know, inanimate objects coming alive kind of thing. And so I remember one day flipping the channels when I was a kid. It was probably, I don't know if it was the 430 movie or something. And I remember the coming upon the scene where the woman who plays Molly, who's kind of like the goody two shoes in the movie. Right the blonde girl who's kind of befriended Chuck Connors and which is, you know, he has, takes a liking to she's out in the woods and it's probably the third in the beginning of the third act. And like a lot of her friends are being trapped or killed or whatever. And she's out in the woods and suddenly you see this terrifying large man that looks like a poor man's leather face with a little puppet head and starts screaming, Molly, Ma, and he's like running around with his head. And I'm like, why is this thing talking? Why does this guy look like a poor man's leather face? And what the fuck is this movie, right? And then I had to go find the movie and watch it from the beginning. And the movie does a lot of things that we love. It's right out the gate. You get your, you know, the protagonists who are going to get killed. Within 10 minutes, you've met who's going to be the killer or kind of an eerie guy. And the three girls go skinny dipping. They go skinny dipping. We we get naked girls. No, you don't. Oh, I do, you do it. I mean, I don't know what you no. watched. No. Oh, do you there's get to no, see them naked there's... in some version I was not aware of? No. Yes. No. I'll be no. watching this. There's, no, there's, there's no nudity in this film was ever shot for this film. Are you positive, Steve? This is I'm 100%. sure I have a cut. I'm 100%. Sure. Well, maybe because I saw it in my brain. The, di the director was too nervous to ask the actresses before they signed the movie whether or not they would do nudity. I would be so too. when they came <laughs> when they came to do the skinny dipping scene, he brought it up and all three of them were Said, like, no, no. Nah. Right, so it's implied. And that's the reason this is one of the only PG slasher films ever created. Interesting. All right. Yeah, so there's not much it, that's R rated in the so it's nope. a, definitely an implied thing that makes you think that's to me, yeah, maybe the how well directed those scenes were is that it's implied well enough that you don't need to see everything, but it's implied just like yeah. a lot of the horror is implied. And I think for me, it's kind of like a cross between house of wax meets Texas chainsaw massacre meets what would be made a year later maniac. Right. Yeah. Mm. And obviously a lot of horror films, the progenitor of a lot of horror films is psycho. So you kind of have a little bit of psycho in there. And, and this also was a, a year after Halloween. So there's a little bit of John Carpenter there, a little bit of poor, you know, again, very low budget, very kind of like playing with the genres, right? And trying to find another way to tackle the horror genre. You have, why is her name escaping me? She was in Charlie's Angels. Tanya Roberts. Tanya Roberts. Lovely to look at, oh. you know. Um, you don't Indeed. like her, Latham? Oh, no, I really, no, really he's do. A, that oh, that okay. was an annoying noise. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. So, so the, you have Tanya Roberts, you have this this other uh, uh, brunette, and then you have this kind of feeble, I mean, don't forget the joke in a lot of horror films were that anybody who liked to have sex gets killed, Yes. right? Yep. So that remains true in this movie in a lot of ways. And then I think Chuck Connors was the third choice. Wow. I think they, they had reached out he to- was, he, he was at least second. I know initially the role was offered to Jack Palance. <laughs> Jack Palance, that's right. That's right. Um, and Chuck Connors was apparently trying to rebuild his career much the way Boris Karloff did in, this, in the latter half mm. of his career and be kind of like this sort of horror movie opposing figure staple mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to try and, and try and build that. And unfortunately, this mm -hmm. wasn't the film to do it for him. No. And, and so a lot of the horror and, and the weird thing about the horror is that it's actually telekinesis, right? Like. Yes, it, which they never explain or discuss. Ever, ever. Nope. Just, it's just implied and it, 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 it explains if you need it that that's how this guy is able to animate these puppets or mannequins. And then it's so low budget that these mannequins are actually supposed to be 
have been real people that he turned into mannequins. Somehow, and they go right? back and forth too. Like they become. There are some that yes. So whatever. So see, that sometimes is. you see like you'll see wooden hands and then like like a real hand inside yeah. a pile of wooden hands. Moving. Oh yeah, that's yeah. that one shot near the end. I remember that. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of low budget like ways of producing this film that, in a weird way, made it scarier for me than if it was done with more money. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, yeah, and, right on. And so. Like the jaws even like effect. the guy that's trapped in the yeah like the guy's trapped in the door and then like things are flying at him who cares but just the idea of like you see a a, a mannequin and then it's like extended jaw opening up and down or kind yeah. of moving looks dumb but it still ignites this thing from when I was younger that just terrified me and then I and then I I don't often I know the idea of good horror is to put yourself in the in the situation and wonder well what the fuck would I do right do you run do you stay and fight off the thing what do you do and this movie kept putting me inside the scene of what would I do and I think I would be a, a deer in headlights to be honest cuz yeah it's so in it's just attacking I think the one of the things that scares me and I don't know what it is about mannequins that scares me so I can understand anybody else watching this movie be like, that is the dumbest movie I've ever seen. I totally get it. You know, well, it's far from the dumbest thing I've ever seen. That's for sure. Right. Right. Well, what did you, what, what, I mean, I could talk a little more about, but what was your take? I know that was like, it's a real guilty pleasure. Yeah, no, uh, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's what we said. It's, it's exactly what you think it is. Yeah. You know, I definitely think that reading a little more about it today, mm -hmm. I'm actually, it's kind of interesting to see the sort of second life it's received in the last 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of seen a resurgence. Mm -hmm. Apparently Stephen King wrote about it in Dance Macabre. Oh, and really? It, and it gave it, it gave it a certain level of credibility where suddenly people were like, oh, well, right. wait a second. And now, you know, and then, which immediately elevated it several notches on everyone's, you know, uh, respect belt. Sure. But. A couple of things. Uh, so this was directed by the guy who would eventually would go on. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but it was it was produced by Charles Band, who is well known for Full Moon Pictures, and he's got three hundred and some odd producing credits on IMDb. And there's probably not an entirely great film Among out of all three hundred films put together. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, it's this guy makes schlock. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the guy who brought you the ginger dead man, wow. <laughs> uh, killer bong. And he's brought, and he's done seven killer bong movies. Jeez. You know, that's all you had to say, Steve. And, and he's done at least four ginger dead man. So I oh. mean, this, neither, you know, but, but they've also created the puppet master series. Mm -hmm. Now you can, hold whatever position you want about the Puppet Master films. However, the guy that directed this film, David Schmoller, wrote and directed the original Puppet Master, mm -hmm. which I do have a little bit of a soft spot. For. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, this film was actually based on his, his senior film project from film school, uh, a short film he did huh. called uh, A Spider Will Kill You. Hmm. And uh, so he rewrote it as a feature. And then uh, originally he wanted to get John Carpenter to direct this film. That was not going to be in the cards though. Due to financial and scheduling at that time, obviously John would have been in the middle of... Escape from New York? No, too early. Uh, this He the would have fog. been in the middle of the fog probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would probably be the, main, the biggest concern. This film has been dealt with by Rift Tracks. I don't know if you've had a chance to no, view no, no. <laughs> their, their version, but... Uh, uh, that was definitely definitely worth a watch. And then um, the creepy laughter from the opening sequence where the kid's trapped in that oh, room. Yeah. Uh, that was pulled from the hyenas from Disney's Lady in the Tree. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Which well, I thought was hysterical. I, I feel like, though, as I, I've seen this movie many times because it, it creeps me out and I keep revisiting. I'm trying to face something. and But technically, <laughs> I feel like the movie hits the marks of a horror film you know it does it does get there and yeah the only clumsy, mark it doesn't hit is boobs that, <laughs> that, that i yeah except that's in my mind clearly i understand yeah, yeah. but from that era from that era the early set the late 70s the, the mid 80s yeah. slasher movie that's the only thing it's missing right 
Right. And I swear to God, I think I have a version of it with that. And I need to. You can't. I I know you. I know you said. Unless saying, someone has edited boobs into it for you. Right. That's right. It'd just be. <laughs> from another movie. From from Seika. <laughs> yeah. Seika's boobs. Got Seika's skinny dipping pool that's, party. That's right. But um, no, but, but it does technically hit its marks. It does move the story along. It, it, it plays with the complication of wait, is Chuck Connors the bad guy or is he not the bad guy until he's the bad, until it's the reveal that he is the bad guy and that he's clearly nuts. And they tell you enough backstory to kind of give gravitas to, except we don't know why he has telekinesis, telekinesis powers, you know, wh why right, this guy right. has powers. And that's just only to explain why these things can come alive and stuff, you know, so. And then he has a yeah. dance with his dead wife at the end. Yes. You know, so anyway, yeah, I... I can totally understand if you're like, Dean, what is wrong with you? You know, like with this one, you know? No, that's, so. that's the whole point of it being a guilty pleasure. Yeah. It's it, yeah. you know, there's no, this is, there's no judgment. <laughs> no, I'm it's judging. Just, it's always I'm interesting. Judging. It's all, well, <laughs> Hassan may judge you, right. but uh, it's, it's always interesting to see, you know, the movies that, you know, stick with people for yeah. whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's one of the fun th parts of, of doing something like, you know, this, what we do yep. uh, is, you know, it's fun to kind of go through all that. Yep. Um, Dean, after, so, you know, oh, I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead Dean, Lyle. after this scarred you in 79, were you able to go see Mannequin seven years later <laughs> with Kim? I, I, I've never seen Mannequin. I don't, I, I, can't do uh, I, I wouldn't, I, can't. I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, he changes back and forth a lot. It's, it's, oh, okay. <laughs> You abs, you absolutely and have. Andrew to. Kim Cattrall is, is Kim Cattrall is so cute at that point. Oh, <laughs> wow, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> that's hilarious. I would, I have a few things, Stevie. Go I don't know. It. I, I didn't, I didn't hate it. Hated it. <laughs> I hated it. The, I really think the opening kill scene in in the room is cleverly edited and done. Yeah, especially with all the gadget stuff. I really like that. And it reminded me of like a movie I'd want to make. And that got me into it at that point. So I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, you know, I was like, okay, that's kind of creative. It mm -hmm. seems like they had a high, higher concept idea, but a lower budget to work with to unfulfill it or that right. it could be fulfilled. But, we, you know, they had lots of mannequins in this. And anytime one of them opens their mouth and the jaw drops with that yep. horrible noise, I mean, I think that's effective. Yeah. Yeah, oh my god it's terrible <laughs> it, it sticks with you um the, the editing the editing is well done throughout the film especially for a horror movie there's mm -hmm. a lot of dead dead space parts which kind of don't make it good yep you know tanya roberts anytime she's on screen she adds a quarter of a star to this movie alone yep, in her yep. Short quarter shorts, of along stuff. With that other brunette. <laughs> yeah, yeah she's great and the, it don't the one weird factoid i read was in the scene where tanya roberts dies where they throw the a the axe into her i guess that was on like a wire and she had like a a block of wood attached mm. to her back and it wasn't a stunt yep. woman it was her and the axe yeah. goes down the wire into this block of wood and i mean yeah the knife yeah the, the knife i'm sorry whatever it was yeah it's, it's just yeah. i mean that's a little i guess that yep. then you could get away with doing that but that would never happen making a not today to no, just, to, just do it with cg yeah. to speak to something you were saying about i i she wrote to my buddy mike o'shea this director of transfiguration and i and i wrote to him i said i'm obsessed with the potential of this movie ah uh, yes do you know what i mean yes absolutely. like <laughs> and and he he's actually going to look into the possibility of, of does somebody have the rights to remake it because it's one of the only movies I've ever watched where and again, we, we're going full circle with the idea of self-entitled fans, right? Like yeah. where I feel like <laughs> yeah, I want to make this property, make your own move, remake. I can always do that. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to make, I want to, I want to honor this film by making it better somehow. You know, I, I, okay. I'm obsessed with, with the potential of this idea because it is a mashup clearly of other horror films that they put together to make this, which is why it's kind of like a poor man's version of other these other movies, but I want to uplift it somehow. And and yet I still have a, a strong heart for it. You know, like I love this movie uh, you could, you as bad like as it guy, is. The guy who directed the Shining sequel, Dr. Sleep, he he was a gigantic yeah. Shining fan and wanted nothing huh. more to 
to make it get... up to that par, which is impossible. So was it good? Anybody? Do you guys it see? Fantastic! It? It's, really? It's it's good. It's it definitely not amazing. a throwaway. It's if you wow. like the shining, it's worth it. Okay. All right. Great. It's it's so completely unlike the shining. Right. It's and yet it's faithful. nothing like and yet faithful. It. And, absolutely faith fantastic and, and it's really good like really was, cool was, homage stuff in it i was blown away by how good that's it was. great that's great okay cool and a great bad guy in it or bad girl okay it. all right yeah cool cool man yep yeah so i well hey man it, it, this was a great talk it's we went over two hours i think well oh, we're not funny. done hmm. We're not done. Oh my god! Oh wait, is this where we you, do the martini right now? Right? Yeah, like this is the, this is the part. Where we, no, uh, <laughs> so uh, this is this is the part. This is the part where we go down the tubes. And again, the internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's it's a series of tubes. So now we, uh, I sent you all uh, copies of the film posters, and we discussed oh, the. Right. Uh, the posters we uh, that were made for this. Right. What are we doing first, Stevie? Once upon a time in the West. Okay. Hold on, I'm I'm gonna open that up. Okay. Did you? Did, I forgot, Dean. Did you look at them or not look? At I them? didn't. This is my first time, right? Oh, wow. good, good. There's a whole lot. Uh, there are a lot. Uh, there uh, for this particular film, I was able to find actually 15 different American and international official posters. Wow. Uh, and then there's 10 or 11 fan made images so i'm looking at the first one you wait you sent it should be it should be image 01 us 01 us and then and then we'll just we'll just track right so in order so yeah i got i got the first one open and with that guys being shot and or i guess they're it's oh is that the, the, the train oh, station yeah 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 the train yeah. station and that's a that's a frank mccarthy painting it's great yeah man a very, a very extreme kind of almost abstracted uh perspective which is yeah it's really it's almost comic booky in that way mm -hmm. oh i and never knew this there were three men in her life one to take her one to love her and one to kill her oh wow <laughs> uh, yeah i hadn't heard that before okay cool so there's three or four kind of main art pieces that were done for this film and that kind of comprises um there's a wider array of the italian posters just uh, for obvious reasons mm -hmm. uh, but for most of the other international markets you'll see that uh, a lot of them used this actual image and poster as it is and mm -hmm. all they did was change out where it says once upon a time in the west mm -hmm. they just changed that into whatever language mm. for their you know for their country right so the u.s insert poster again is a slightly different kind of it's a different uh Yep. painted image for uh, McCarthy and then obviously with the four heads uh, this was actually a US insert poster I love the colors of that one the yellow yeah. and the brown and the you know the the red yep. background and then the new um, the other one the the UK the UK quad right is just a kind of a reorganization because the the British quad posters are a different aspect so they you know they go sideways this being a podcast are you giving me a show this at all to the people listening or all these images get posted up on our okay. website at the same time as the podcast and then we just kind of direct people to go there to, to get the images great. to go along with it great uh and if it gets posted up uh this one may actually be the one of the first ones that gets posted up as a as an actual edited video version in which case we'll actually have the images up on screen right. so people can actually kind of right. watch it play out i see the french version it's funny they keep using the first scene as their yeah, uh, their selling point. You know, their their graphic. Yes, you know different uh, angles of that first scene. Classic Western. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then we go to the German, which is uh, a reworking of the Frank McCarthy image, but not the actual Frank McCarthy image, which is kind of interesting. Oh yeah. Well, some of it is. The heads are not. The heads are not. And if you look closely, the other one, it, it's still a reworking of the McCarthy image. It's not the actual image. Right. Or perhaps this was maybe this maybe was a comp. Maybe it was a color comp. Yeah, I think Wait, it's... we're not saying the the name how listen, the French version was called Il Etat Une Fois Dans Louis. I don't know how to say French. And then the I love I love the German Spielmer das Lied von Todd. Yes. Well, okay, so yeah. that's I actually for didn't You fucked up. <laughs> I don't know. Give me one second. The German title, oh, I got to find this now. The German title for the movie is not Once Upon a Time in the West. Mm. 
Was it changed in other foreign editions as well, or just in German? Only in Germany. Because I went ahead to the first Italian, and I can't believe that they're showing a very important plot reveal. Yeah, like there's a <laughs> spoiler in the poster, you dummy. Oh, my God. I mean, that's just dumb. Yeah. It's fun. I think it means, I think the German one means then to the West. Then to the West? No, that doesn't make sense. Never mind. No, it was something completely different. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm useless. I can find out though. Hold on. I'll find out while you're doing this. Yeah, but you know that the first Italian that's the one you're talking about, Dean? The one with uh, with her on yeah. the ground. Yeah. You blew it with this. But you know what? You if it. you're not gonna know the connection no, you're not. there with that. No, you're not. Image. You know you're not. It, it's you just but you're gonna wait for that scene. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, you're gonna be going like, well, I don't understand why that's even on the poster. <laughs> right. And then the next you just throw that out and put Claudia in the middle yeah. you know i can't believe she's getting top billing here really too over fonda and robards in essence well she's italian well i know i understand that but that's i mean it's henry fonda for fuck's sake I mean, right spiel mir das lied vom todd yes means once upon a time in the west oh well that makes sense. according to the translator well that <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what mine did too. <laughs> that's weird yeah. because I, I I read something about the fact that I, I believe yeah, you probably had, see oh, it. I, I got I it. You song. <laughs> I got it. It's uh play me the song of death. That's it. Wow. Play me the song of death. And that we will play on the harmonica. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I'm looking at Italian B, the next Italian poser, and yes. it's, it's a it's a really cool drawing of Bronson, but he looks like a hammer horror version of Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like this one. That's exactly right. Holy crap. Uh, and then Italian C and D are a couple of other new pieces of artwork. Uh, they're both good versions. Of, well, the yeah. Jason Robards in the second one looks a little fucking addled, but yeah, yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Oh, because he's pulling the cork out of the bottle. What a fucking shot that uses your source material. Yeah. His eyes are crossed. Yeah. Yeah, that, that looks a little <laughs> not as uh that could that, that looks needed, better yeah. in the uh in the C depiction. Yeah. A, same image. Needs another pass. Better. Needs Very another uh, coat of paint there. I still like the first one. First one's the best. Uh, and then Japanese A, they've just they've used the same McCarthy support image and then used different organized headshots and then right. a photo of Fonda. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. And then oh. and then and Fonda. Yeah. And <laughs> like it's Henry fucking Fonda. He's going in the front of this picture. Right. And then in Japan B, they've moved the the Oof. train station they... shootout to the desert. So. Yep. But you can still okay. see the station way off in the distance. They did a composite of both uh, depictions of this yeah. scene. Right. Yeah. So that's the uh, yeah. Yeah, because the foreground. That's the two foreground Bronson. image of the guy. It's two Bronsons, you think? There's the background well, Bronson, and is that the other one standing up? Oh no, no, that's that's one no, that's Woody. no, that's, that's just Woody. one of the that's with the, that's, yeah. with the, that's what, with oh the right with the, the except it's not sawed off. That's right, it's not. But, but it is the the hand part. The the yep. yeah, interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't look for accuracy. Yeah, <laughs> in any of these, this Belgium version is again, uh, uh, it's a it's somebody's version of the Frank McCarthy poster. Right. Ooh, the Czech one is just weird. Yeah, baby. It looks like a wine label or something. <laughs> oh, wait till you do the next. Wait till you see the East German one. All right, East German. Yeah, it oh, does come on. Like a wine label. Oh, what the hell that's is that? so good. <laughs> I what? love it. it <laughs> right? Kinda, oh. it, it, it's so no, bizarre. No, too esoteric. No, it, too esoteric. Oh, it really is, esoteric, but it's almost like. Um, Play me the song of death. It's like Mickey Mouse art or something. Like, it's just yeah. bizarre. It's like it's like the it's like the Polish movie posters, you know, oh that are like yeah, absolutely right. crazy. Yeah, well, that's at least it's creative. So is that is that supposed to be gold or something? Like the idea that that's gold, maybe that that tan brown color on the uh, Euro International one. Like you're looking too deep. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, I think it's just probably a, a, a that color. I mean, they chose that color for a reason. Yeah. Because it'll make the image pop. Well, you know what's funny, sure. too, yeah. is if you look at, you know, and I think this is probably just the way things are printed back overseas back then. But the image of Henry Fonda there, first of all, he was never dressed like that in the movie. Mm -hmm. But it looks like oh. they took a black and white image and colorized it. Yeah. 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 You know. The green shirt is. Yeah. It's yeah. very strange. It's 
too much. The next one, Federico Mancosu, that's brilliant. That's a harmonica with a, uh, is a train track. Like, that's brilliant. Our first artist poster, this is a, a bit a bit on the minimalist size, obviously. Same as the next one, uh, Greasy yep. Staniak. Yep. Uh, very minimalist, obviously. Yep. He has a whole series of these. Uh, this guy is a... Oh, wow. The next one is so expressionistic. It's incredible. Yeah. Carl Fitzgerald uh, does a lot of modern uh, modern film poster work for, um, I can't remember if it's Mondo or Bottleneck. Right. He's done a ton of work in the last few years, print stuff. That's a cool one. Steve, Steve you're a publisher who, who, you know, publishes, you know, art of, of, for famous franchises and movies. What about a yes. Leone book? The discussion is the discussion has come up. Okay, all right, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> so next we have uh, Livio Bernardo. It's yeah. this is kind of this is kind of cool because it's it's you know stair steps down through. Oh, it's fantastic. Wow. That's it's, fantastic. Uh, I like everything but the uh, Sergio Leone's masterpiece. I don't like that, but everything else is great. Yeah. Um, also, the next one, which is uh, that's an Oliver Barrett piece. And you know, in the negative space, being the skull yep. is just is just perfect. You know, yep. yeah. I just said, "Wow, that's great!" And you almost wouldn't notice it. You, you wouldn't know? notice it if you weren't looking at like a smaller version. Yeah, the thumbnail where, the, where, the, where everything really... was abstracted down. Yeah, that that's great. Yeah. That's just oh, the great. Rupert Gruber one is is really beautiful. The color scheme is beautiful. Uh, getting ahead. Oh, sorry keeps, guys. He sorry, keeps guys. jumping ahead. I know. No, Slow okay. down. He sorry. can't wait. <laughs> he can't wait. I want more. I know. Yeah, <laughs> that's good too. Yep. I like that. Yeah, but this is this is this and the last one are kind of what you see out of a lot of today's uh, alt poster guys. They they really yeah. they put a lot of they put a lot of thought into you know design as well as key elements. Yep. What comes out more often than not is just absolutely amazing. So it's so minimalist too. I like the minimalism. Yeah. Know? minimalism is done right it can be it can be a just a a lot of fun yeah um especially if they're being tricky yeah and and b just the you know the how you boil an entire film down to one or two elements yep. and have everything again if you know the movie having everything make sense yeah you know it's 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 kind of amazing yeah yeah so this this one kind of reminds me of an art project sam coil yeah He's, it's kind of collagey. It, yeah. it is, and it's also like graffiti in a way, like the X's on the guys who've been shot, and then like there's this and like the extra kind of, eyes of hers. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. At first, I didn't like it, but the more I look at it, I like it better. Yeah. Huh. So next is uh, a designer goes by the name of Sister Hyde. It's like a horror movie. This one. It, it is almost. It's almost more like uh, you know, trapped in a cave or you know, trapped yeah. in a mine. What's the film? The Prowler. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then Stefania Antonioli, another very minimalist piece, but I like I like the use of the uh, the Monument Valley as the hat. And it also yeah. is the only one that evokes Clint Eastwood to me for some reason. Yes. Yeah. I sure. agree a hundred percent. It's interesting. Almost like banking on like if you like earlier Leone films, check out his new one. Wink at Clint Eastwood. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Yep. The next one is a, an illustrator named Tony Stella. Mm. Has a very, very strong sort of throwback feel to his art. Uh, yeah. Very classic painted movie poster yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, I really like his work a lot. He, he, we've, he's shown up on a couple of other uh, things that we've done. Uh, and then Tricia Swindell. This is, a, this is actually kind of a nice piece. I actually, yeah. I actually really like the way this was done. Yeah, uh, with just sort of like almost it's almost almost done. Whereas the stains are almost an afterthought, but yet still defines yeah. that figure. Well, it's a it's like a watercolor abstract, you know, in a classic in a classic po pose. So that's why you can go abstract because you know what it is, and then yeah. you see a more defined uh, Bronson in the background. Yeah, it's and amazing. the lettering is really cool. The font is really cool. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then the last one here is Vincent Roche. Hmm. And again, this is just a just a real simple play on things. Yep. Giving you all the elements, all the pieces you need. Yep. Yep. I like the skull one the best. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah, Oliver Barrett's pieces is, is uh 
is pretty cool. Yeah, man. All right, so next we will go on to the tourist trap okay, images. Grab that. There are far fewer of those, so. Okay, open. All right. Yeah, that's the first one. That's the one I know, the classic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not bad for a 79 poster. That's pretty... Uh... Yeah, posters better than the movie. And, and clearly, <laughs> li, 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 yeah, right. And clearly, again, any fan of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I mean, this is before a second one was made. So you only had the one yeah. Texas Chainsaw. I mean, if you're a fan of that, you're dying to see a movie like this, you know, especially. And you're only movie. deterred by the PG rating at the bottom. Yeah, I didn't realize it was a PG movie, man. It's amazing. I mean, yeah. it's. There's no PG 13, so they had to go one way or the other. Yep. There's no swearing in it. Yep. So. And guess yeah. what? You didn't need. You don't need nipples and, and cursing. You don't need it. <laughs> well, I would have preferred no the, the, nip, the nipples and You're the right. cursing, but yes, we will not comment. Listen, LL Jocelyn Cool J. Jones, that's the other. Chick. Public Enemy said that LL Cool J made the hardest album with "Mama Said Knock You Out." There's not one curse in it. Yep, that's right. Um, this next one. So USB was uh, an alternate version of that poster. Right. Which is... That's good, too. Yeah, this is... I would argue that this one is actually creepier than the other Yeah, one. a lot more horrific. There's, like, directly horrific instead of instead of impressionistically, which is not well, a it's, word. It's, in a way, it's more horrific because, again, speaking to the low-budget nature, the PG nature, it's almost like a poor man's quality, which, in a way, makes it scarier. I don't know why. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. The next image, uh, I don't usually use DVD cover art with this because we try to stick with posters. Right. But I just thought that this was so interesting that they chose to go a route that almost makes this look like Wolf Creek. Or it looks like a Jim Thompson novel. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like, yeah. okay, it has nothing to do, it, does, it, does, it just looks like some weird Western kind of crime novel, you know? Yeah. Uh, Once upon a time at Clausen's Oasis. That's right. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so then, so then the German poster, uh, which is essentially the same as the U.S. A poster, but they 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 covered up the the image of the girl and the drop of blood in the camera lens, and replaced it with a fake film reel with stills from the film. Oh yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And you know what? For the first time, I'm noticing that they're trying to play it up that it's like a killer woman, a female. Right. You know, which... Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. So that's a good... And then the story. Italian, it was called Puppet. Mm. <laughs> yes, it was. You have to say it like that, puppet. or you can't You can't get in to see the film. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. I'm here to yeah. see Puppet. No, puppet. Yeah. no. <laughs> uh. Oh, yeah, yeah, the 18 years old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. Maybe that's the version you want to see if you want nudity. Yeah. This, Japan, this Japanese poster wow. kind of blew me away. Yeah, yeah it's it's so... Wow. What is that? Is that a crow or... It's a it's yeah. a buzzard or a vulture, and it's the very last thing they show in the movie. You're right. That's it's the weird. very last... Well, that's ruining the ending. It's the very last... <laughs> that is so weird. Here's the ending, Japanese folk. Wow. <laughs> So then Devin Whitehead uh, created... By the way, the way the movie ends, at least what I remember, is that she escapes and she has all these puppet versions of her friends in the car, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. That last shot. And no it need freezes to watch on it her smiling. <laughs> and I swear to God, there's got to be a sequel. we got to make the sequel as well as the remake. Or maybe the remake is the sequel. I don't know. Anyway. Right. The, I think that the director at that point is just like, you know what? No one knows who's a mannequin and who's not. So we're just going to have her drive the fuck down the That's road right. with a bunch of mannequins. Right. Now, five minutes ago, did I think to myself, wow, we got through that whole review without revealing the ending so that I could watch it. Oh, you can still, you can yeah. still watch still it. You still need to see the shot. <laughs> the shot is worth seeing. It's a pretty cool shot. Dean, you actually had a really, uh, it's a really interesting take on that because how interesting would it be to go into a sequel of that film and to show her like have a bunch of people bump, run into her a number of years later. Yes. Who've got all her friends still around her. Yes. But the difference is, is that different people would show up as mannequins and or real actors yes. throughout the course of the film. Yes. 
And at different points of the film, depending on who was in the scene or who was talking or who you're dealing with, that would change around. So it you were never really of, sure right. who was a mannequin and who was alive and who, until and, the very end. And you exactly. saw whose viewpoint the film was reality. That's right. And that's why we're going to get your buddy John Carpenter to direct it. We'll write it. <laughs> and we'll make it happen. Make it happen. You got a good shot of getting Tanya Roberts involved, too. I guarantee <laughs> Yes. It. Yes. Uh, probably for a nude scene as I well. I think so. This next one is, is actually the scariest one. It looks almost yes, like it, a, a like an erotic horror Which horror one is film. that? Is Devin Whitehead? Devin okay. Whitehead, yeah. Yeah, he actually did this for a t-shirt. This is art that was done for a t-shirt for... It was either Cavity Colors or Fright Rags. I can't remember. Huh. They released a T-shirt and a couple of pins, and mm -hmm. and this was uh, this was the T-shirt art that he went back and threw the logo on and make an image. And then the last one was a guy named Mario Frias. There's still a couple of watermarks on this. I removed a few of the watermarks mm -hmm. just so the image could be you know could see it a little better. Dude, this one is terrifying. This, yeah, this is very <laughs> thorough. It, it covers it, everybody in the But film. I will say, this is the kind of thing that when I think about this movie, it's like, what is going on? What is going on here? <laughs> Why? So, so, so oh, I'll get this printed God. out and have one posted above your bed soon. No, never. <laughs> I like this one a lot. Oh, I think my this God. one's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, this is. Like, like Hassan said, this is probably better than the movie. What's going yeah. on here? So, <laughs> that's. Just worrying about this. Is better so, than so, with that in mind, I, I'm very forgiving, uh, clearly, with uh, a lot of my. I, I probably have more guilty pleasures than than a love of the masterpieces, you know? Um, because I add that layer of forgiveness and, and, and I give it, like I said, I'm obsessed with the potential of this movie, but there's right. still enough there that I'm like, okay, I, I like this. I, can, I, I feel like I can still recommend it and, because it comes with a discussion or an explanation <laughs> in a way, you know, from the person who yeah, likes it. And then you can have a talk about it, you know, what we're doing right now. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. So, do you think uh, do you think Tanya Roberts was cast in uh, Beastmaster because of this film? Probably. And Not and <laughs> and, and did she play Sheena or something like that? Yeah, Sheena was eighty four. I think Beastmaster jungle, yeah. was, and she's fully 82. nude in that one. Yeah, she is nude. And now. that's a superhero movie for kids, right? In a way, back then, pretty much, pretty much, right? That wasn't an uh, yeah. Sheena was PG, right? Uh, maybe, but PG was so different back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> she's got a topless scene. In. She's, no, she's fu fully naked in Sheena. Is she? Yes. Uh, you thought there were boobs and tourist straps, so it's hard telling. <laughs> I swear to God, guys, <laughs> no, I may just shot. think that women are just naked type in, type in right now. Tanya Roberts, no, nude Sheena, and you'll no, 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 no <laughs> browser history. That was a no, PG movie. She is naked in that. <laughs> What did we just that. talk about the uh, social media? You're you're gonna put that in your I know, browser. History. I know, I know. <laughs> well, that's not a bad one to put in. I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Let's it was it correlated. Team. We'll take the heat for it. That's we don't right. give it. No, nah, we there's no we, white man. Okay. That's right. No, all right. Put it on me. I don't give a shit. He meant O U I. Hassan's got a reputation of protection. O U I. Oh, I we. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Dean is <laughs> Dean, Dean is correct. Uh, that is head to head mm -hmm. to mid thigh nudity. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a PG movie. Mm -hmm. PG know. movies were better, guys. PG movies even... were the way to make movies. How can no one was uptight back then? That's right. How so, can that pull hearts out of chests and have it be PG? Yep. Yeah. So she just walks up, fully naked, and steps into the pond. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What else? <laughs> our podcast has been paused Steve, while Steve, our glorious leader checks Steve, out some is Steve, Latham gets a little hangry at the end of the podcast. <laughs> I have a pizza right next to me. I'm just not eating it. <laughs> as, as, as Latham would like to always get to before we get to the posters, the martini. Uh, where we discuss where does this film rank in this director's library? Um, having done seven films, uh, and most of us have seen the majority of them. We're talking about Leone again, right? <laughs> okay. Leone, yes, sir. Not, not, not David Schmoller. <laughs> Sorry, David, if you're listening. Eventually, he will. <laughs> he's not. He's he's not. <laughs> so, so, so Hassan Hassan is going to side with uh, Good, the Bad, I. and the Ugly. Ah, uh, yes. As is as is Latham. I'm torn. I'm 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 honestly torn. I probably 
I think as far as the story goes, the good and the bad and the ugly holds a slight advantage. But as far as just the overall feel and look all the way through it, I, I kind of want to say Once Upon a Time in the West. I'm kind of split between the two. Um, without having seen Once Upon a Time in America, which I understand is... It is. I'd step. put that second. So. You guys see the long one, though. Okay. Yeah, I no, see the, the abbreviated one. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the three yeah. the three hour and 49 Dean, minute one. what do you one. think of that one? I love yeah. Once Upon a Time in America. I've only seen it once. I need to see it again. I, uh, I'm trying to remember something. Steve, you saw Duck, You Sucker, Fistful of Dynamite. Is there a weird ending in that movie where... Was it the two men were in love with the same woman? Or yes. S- or is that, is that like a weird we're reveal at the, the very end? Away. Well, it was just, it was just, it was just well, it wasn't <laughs> oh. necessarily, but it was, you know, I don't think it was necessarily meant as they were both in love with the same woman thing. It was more. It's not a, cry, it's not an no, important. It was it's more, actually an odd yeah, additional. Because yeah, after that particular character passes, they do it to a flashback sequence that. for And, and, and like, why? It's well. It's probably one of the only ones that he hangs on. I think too long. Agreed. It's. It's. Uh, I think that that particular. I. Do, I think he should have in, enclosed it within the story and ended the movie with the ending that we know right. and not added this on as a. It coach. felt like an additional. You're right. Like it, it's supposed to give it this other. It felt out of place. Yes. For him. Yes. So anyway, I, I was trying to remember if that was yeah. in, a, in America, but no, it's in Duck, You Sucker. Yeah. And so I need to see yeah. America again, but I don't know. I don't think I saw the long one. And of course you need to see the long one. Yes. You know? That's the three hour and 49 minute. Right. Right. Is which James, is actually, which is actually only half the length of the ver- the original version he delivered to the studio, which was a six wow. hour cut that he intended to sell as two, three hour films. Wow. Because apparently he shot, between eight and ten hours of actual usable story, wow. which he whittled, which he whittled down to six. The studio said no fucking way, mm-hmm. and that's when he came back with the three hour and forty nine minute version, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's the one that they tried to sell. And then TV said no fucking no, way, and right. we're going to make a two hour version, right. which, which is then somehow un- got un- got circulated as a definitive version for the long. And that that was that was that was the one that was put into main release, and everyone panned it. And then when they went back and released the three hour and 49 minute version, right. everyone's like, oh, this is one of the greatest films ever made. Right. 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 You know, yeah, what he does the director. What yeah. can the director know? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. People right. in their long. Yeah. No, he, he told big stories. It's like Kingdom yeah. of Heaven all over again. We want it to fit in this format. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. uh, the millennial. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll just cut out. Uh, I'll just cut out 30 solid minutes of plot. And uh, I guess it's, I'll guess it'll all work. So what version of this podcast are you going to put up? <laughs> Ooh, uh, we got a, lot well, well, a, a not too subtle nod at, at the fact that this might be running long. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> kidding. Uh, no, no, no. Our one was four hours. This one's two fifty. That's true. Wow. Uh, all right, so, so let me do my let me do my my thanks and outro, and then we'll uh, <laughs> we can discuss. Okay. When are we doing uh, the martini? So, uh, <laughs> oh my god! I'm going to give you a fucking <laughs> in a second. Our thanks to Purple Planet Music. Get your own awesome music at purple-planet.com. Please check out our website at sentimentalpod.com for all the poster images we discuss on our Down the Tube segment. And don't forget to download and subscribe to Sentimental wherever you enjoy your podcasts. And you can always listen to new episodes at sentimentalpod.com. Also, you can follow us on all major social media accounts at sentimentalpod. Our thanks to Hassan Godwin and Lathan Conger III, and of course, to our special guest, Dean Haspiel. And as always, in the immortal words of Ubermensch Truman Burbank, Good afternoon, good evening, and good night.